Hi everyone, my name is Whitney and I'm a registered dental hygienist here to debunk five popular fluoride myths. And before we get started, I need to make something clear. Although yes, I am a dental hygienist, I am not affiliated with any toothpaste brand, Big Pharma, Big Dental, or any kind of fluoride industry. Whether you use fluoride toothpaste or not, it doesn't affect my paycheck. I get paid hourly, I clean your teeth, I don't fill your cavities. This video is intended to simply be a public health service trying to boost oral health literacy and bust some of the most common fluoride myths out there right now. And of course, all of my sources are linked in the description box below. Having said all of that, let's talk. Myth number one, fluoride is toxic. The toothpaste label even says not to swallow it. Now, this first myth is a two-parter. For the first part, fluoride is toxic. Saying anything is toxic without context and dosage is based upon misinformation. This is because anything can be toxic at a high enough dose. Eating way too much spinach can cause toxicity. Although we need a specific amount of oxygen to live, to breathe, if we had too much, it would be toxic to our lungs. Even vitamins, which many people like taking, they can be toxic if you take too much or too many of them, right? It is possible to overdose on, say, vitamin D. Dosage matters with everything, not just fluoride. Now, for the second part, toothpaste labels worn against swallowing, this is because a child who, say, decides to eat an entire tube of toothpaste, that would create a situation on where someone is getting a dose far beyond what's safe. Fluoride toothpaste is intended to be used as directed to brush with it and then spit it out. It's dosed for topical use on your teeth, not to be eaten like candy. Having that safety label on the toothpaste doesn't mean the ingredient itself is dangerous, but it's to say that it can be dangerous if used incorrectly, aka eating it in a large amount. If you want to learn more about toxicity and dosing of fluoride toothpaste, I will link that video of mine below, which goes into the specific amounts of toothpaste you can eat daily based on your weight without having toxic effects. Not that I recommend anyone eating toothpaste. You should not eat toothpaste just like you shouldn't eat lip balm or chapstick or face wash, right? And if you're still worried about kids swallowing a little bit of it since they aren't good at spitting yet, again, that video of mine explains how for kids under the age of three, you want to use a rice-sized smear amount on the brush. And for kids over the age of three and adults, using a pea-sized amount is recommended. You don't need to use globs and Labs of it. Anyway, I highly recommend you watch that video of mine before you argue that we might swallow a minuscule amount after we spit. Next, myth number two. Fluoride is used in rat poison. Now, with this one, yes, some compounds that contain fluoride have been used in certain pest poisons in the past. But the key word here is compounds. The fluoride ion doesn't exist on its own in nature. It's always bound to compounds. The one used in dental care is not the same as the one used in poisons. For instance, sodium fluoride or Stannous fluoride are the compounds used in toothpaste, whereas sodium fluoroacetate is a compound that can be used in a pest control agent. Completely different compounds. A simple way to understand this, it's like saying table salt, which is sodium chloride, is dangerous because bleach, which is sodium hypochlorite, is toxic. Both salt and bleach contain sodium, but they're completely different chemical compounds. One you eat, salt. The other you avoid eating, bleach, because it would be toxic to eat. Bottom line, saying fluoride is used in rat poison, so don't use fluoride toothpaste, is like saying oxygen oxygen is used in rocket fuel, so don't breathe the oxygen in our air. It's fear-based, not fact-based. Myth number three, fluoride is a fertilizer byproduct. Gross. This is another fear-based claim that gets thrown around, and while it sounds alarming without context, the truth is that the origin of fluoride does not determine its safety. Like we just mentioned, its chemical form and dosage matter most. Here's an analogy to explain this one. Acetic acid, a substance too harsh to consume on its own, becomes vinegar after it's diluted and processed. Fluoride undergoes a similar transformation. Once it's refined, regulated, and added in tiny amounts to public water, it's safe and beneficial. Another example is table salt again. So table salt, or NaCl, it can come from either evaporated seawater or mined rock, which contain contaminants. But once it's purified, it's safe to eat. It's table salt. But if you eat, say, or try to eat 20 cups of salt, then it's not safe again. No matter where the salt came from, too much salt is bad. Context and concentration matter. Overall, whether fluoride comes from calcium calcium fluoride or fluorosilicic acid, the resulting fluoride ion that ends up in water is the same. The original source does not affect the body. What matters for safety is the refining and diluting process and the amount used. Myth number four, why do we even need fluoride toothpaste if it's in food naturally? So yes, fluoride occurs naturally in some foods, tea, seafood, etc. I have a whole list of foods that naturally contain fluoride in my fluoride toothpaste video that I mentioned earlier, which is linked in the description box below. But having said that, please be aware that 
that those small amounts in food, they are very small, minuscule. So to protect your teeth from decay, from cavities, you need a higher concentration, which is exactly what fluoride toothpaste provides. Fluoride toothpaste helps remineralize tooth enamel directly and resist acid attacks from plaque. You don't get that from eating food that contains fluoride. Overall, while dietary fluoride is a nice bonus, it's not nearly enough for real cavity protection. That's where toothpaste comes in. Next, myth number five, fluoride lowers IQ. This one really worries people, but it's based on misinterpreted studies. The studies linking fluoride to lower IQ looked at much higher levels than what's used in regulated water fluoridation. U.S. public water systems follow the EPA's guidelines of 0.7 ppm, a safe, effective level that's been proven to reduce cavities without harming cognitive health. And the studies that claim a link with IQ have more than double that amount. Some of those studies even contain 10 times that amount. In addition, the studies showing this low IQ link do not account for correlation equaling causation, meaning there are several other confounding factors such as lead exposure, right? You can't measure one thing without measuring all the things someone is exposed to. But again, on top of that, the levels of fluoride in those studies are more than double of what we are exposed to anyway. So just just lots of design flaws and misinterpreted data. Overall, brushing your teeth with fluoride toothpaste and or drinking optimally regulated fluoridated water is not lowering your IQ. Myth number six, nanohydroxyapatite is better than fluoride. Now listen, I actually like nanohydroxyapatite. The science is exciting and it shows promise to be a fluoride alternative one day. But here's the deal right now. Two deals actually. One, fluoride is more stable in acidic environments where cavities form. Meaning if you are cavity prone and you're using nanohydroxyapatite toothpaste, you are getting less enamel protection than you would with a fluoride toothpaste. And two, nanohydroxyapatite isn't medically regulated in the US like fluoride is. That means dosage and quality can vary a lot between brands and these brands are not required to share the research or studies proving the amount of nanohydroxyapatite they claim is in their product. So what they claim might not match what is actually in their product. This is why regulation processes and verification standards by third parties, not just the brands themselves, the companies trying to sell their own products. These regulation processes are critical when it comes to verifying the ingredients the product contains. I could go on and on about the importance of how nanohydroxyapatite must contain at least 10% nano-sized particles, not micro-sized, or else it's not guaranteed to work as well as advertised. So if you want to learn more about fluoride and nanohydroxyapatite, I will also link those videos of mine in the description box below as well. Lastly, myth number seven, they only add fluoride to water. Now, this comment was in regard to water fluoridation programs and how they actually not only add fluoride to public water, but they also remove fluoride from water in places where the natural levels are too high. So yes, fluoride is naturally occurring in rocks and soil, meaning depending on the area in which you live, fluoride may occur naturally at too high of a level. So in those cases, water fluoridation programs monitor and adjust it to stay within safe limits. They either add it or remove it to maintain optimal level based on your community's natural level, which like we mentioned earlier, optimal level is set at 0.7 ppm. Some communities have zero natural fluoride. Others have too much. It just depends on the geographic location. Now, public health initiatives like water fluoridation often get caught up in politics, but it's always important to remember that public health decisions are made based on science, not opinion polls. Whereas politics, on the other hand, often reflect varying opinions and beliefs, which don't always align with scientific consensus. Decades of data show that access to fluoride helps reduce dental disparities, especially in communities without access to dental care. Not everyone has the option to go to the dentist or to buy a toothbrush and to buy toothpaste, and it often comes from a thought of privilege to think otherwise. Water fluoridation initiatives help give those communities without access a fighting chance in preventing dental disease, which leads to less diseases overall. We all know how dental health is directly connected to overall health, so if we can help improve dental health, we are helping improve overall health. I hope this video helped you. Please like, subscribe, and turn on your notifications if it did. And a quick shout out to the YouTube members here and the Patreon members supporting this channel and supporting dental health awareness. If you want to join my mission in making sure evidence-based dental health information is being shared online, become part of our Teeth Talk community. The links to join are in the description box below. And until then, I'll see you on Instagram at Teeth Talk Girl. Peace, love, and teeth.